Okay, hi everybody, I'm Joris. I was just looking into the void because I don't see anybody there, but I can see participants. So, uh, hello, I'm going to start uh, the presentation by sharing my screen. Share. Um, so, I'm here, uh, I was invited to talk to you about content generation because you have this whole summer school about content generation. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I uh, worked on, uh, as, a, on, as a researcher in content generation, but also uh, published uh, a game called Unexplored uh, that has a lot of content generation in there. Uh, and today I want to talk to you a little bit about how we um, approached the content generation in that game because uh, we did it in, a, in the context of a commercial uh, content gen uh, in the context of a commercial game, and that does change things a little bit if, if you compare it to a, a more strict academic uh, setting. So um, you may or may not have heard uh, of Unexplored. Let's change my screen. There we go. Uh, Unexplored 2 is a, is a very traditional roguelike dungeon crawler. Uh, in the, it's based on the, all the traditions. It's going back to rogue. You have to collect the Amulet of Yendor. The only thing is that uh, it's in real time, so it's not a turn-based game. And that already changes a lot of things in how we have to do the uh, content generation. Uh, but it's you know it's a top-down dungeon crawling game, um, and all the levels obviously are uh, procedurally generated. And um, uh, we're actually quite proud of of what we achieved in this in this respect. Um, there's the typical levels that you have. You know, there's, there's rooms connected to corridors and uh, populated with uh, treasures and creatures and, and whatnot. Uh, it can do cave-like things. It can do water. There's a lot of a bunch of things and different themes. Uh, you know, there's this, this weird thing of you can have snow and trees growing inside the dungeon somehow. Um, and that's all fine because you now that's that's part of the, the tropes of the of the genre. That is nothing. The players are not really surprised by all these things. Uh, however, players are very surprised uh, or, or are taken uh, to, to take very uh, care a lot about you know, the, the flow and the pacing and, and the gameplay of the game. So when we approached uh, content generation for this whole project, uh, gameplay was always uh, the first thing that we were aiming for. Um, uh, and I do like to think uh, that we were quite successful. Uh, if you look at all the um, responses and the reviews of the game, and this is, um, I don't know if you know the site of the front games, they are, they're really a little bit sour about their reviews. They, uh, they're very, uh, they, they test whether or not, uh, what, what game designers, the game designers promise, whether or not it's actually, they, they make true on that promise. Uh, and one of the promises that we made is that we generate the levels in, the, in a way that they felt handcrafted and they reluctantly sort of agreed. But, if, but overall, if you look at the reviews that we had on Steam, they were very positive. And uh, at one point, they did account and uh, more than half actually called out the poop content generation as a, as a big plus for the game. I think even a third or so of something of the, the reviews actually called out the content generation in the, in the, in the top three of, of the content generation that they ever encountered. So, yeah, for us, that was something of a success. Um, so, but um, I'm going to break down this talk in, in two parts. First, I'm going to talk about the, the philosophy of the content generation, content generator in, in Explore, and also I'm going to look a little bit in the, at its sequel that we're, that we're developing right now in Explore 2. Um, and then uh, in the last part of the, the, the talk, I'm uh, going to show off uh, the tool and actually try to open uh, this to uh, to the audience as well. Uh, I'm quite curious to find out what you want to see. So uh, with the means that we have, uh, this, uh, this Zoom system, uh, we're going to try and make this as, as interactive as possible. Um, but um, uh, our approach to uh, content generation, I like to think of it as a, as a, as a very designery appro approach to uh, content generation because uh, what we try to do is not uh, look at the technology, more uh, use the technology to, to sort of simulate um, the design lore and ways people actually, uh, humans would actually uh, design games. And there was already a lot of stuff in the introduction that's very relevant for us. You now, the remark about if you want to generate music, then you have to know a lot about the, the way music is structured. It holds very true for the way that we developed and explored. We had to look at a lot of uh, things about how people actually design dungeons. 
But to um, give a, a very s uh, simple contrast to approaches to content generation that I see a, uh, um, a lot of times, um, and that's a sort of a, a quite different approach, it's a sort of very technical bottom-up approach where you take uh, an interesting algorithm and you, you might uh, I do hope you recognize this algorithm as a four or five cellular automata rule to create cave-like uh, dungeons. Um, it's, it's something that I actually you use within uh, an export and uh, it's SQL and export too. Um, but there's also a few uh, downsides with it. There's a few negative uh, aspects to it. Uh, and one of them is it's actually, you, know, you, you can't really scale these things. Um, you know, content generation, uh, you get a lot of content for free, so people have this idea, oh, that can make huge and big worlds, um, but it doesn't really always work. Uh, for, so if you start, if you just make a very big um, map with the same algorithm, what you en actually end up with is a, is a very noisy feel. And, and sure, it might be sort of interesting to explore this cave, but it will not really make a very good game-like experience. Um, and that's what always is what we're always trying to change. And um, part of it is, is that uh, people sometimes tend to uh, treat technology as a black box. And you know, if you have a content generator uh, and there's a, a lots of interesting clever algorithms uh, working, operating under the hood, uh, uh, and, that is, uh, and you get something out of there and it's, it's very interesting um, project. But you, as a technologist, you know that that's not really how it works. And the same is actually true for design. You know, a lot of designers, and they're not really always very conscious about this process, um, they have a, a methodology, they have a, a conscious processes, they uh, uh, do uh, things in a particular order, they, they, they work, and it's very individual, it's not, uh, every designer has its own process, but we can't really treat uh, design as a black box. Now, if, if you look at what real humans do is that they make sketches, uh, if, if you, if you, if I would design a level uh, of an export by hand, I probably would start with uh, a few basic things that I want to be in the level, a couple of themes, maybe uh, a reward or a boss creature, and design the level around from that, and start with a uh, concept of the overall, overall structure of the level, where I, in, in general where I want to uh, want stuff to be, and then start adding the details and not the other way around. And if you go back to uh, this, a lot of people would say, this is where I start and I just need to populate it. And that's, and that's sort of backwards in that, in that, in that process. Um, so um, the content generator that we use actually sort of emulates that whole process. Uh, it starts out from very um, abstract uh, concepts. So it's a very simple graph laying out where more or less rooms of a dungeon would be, and then it's going to uh, assign functions to the rooms, uh, this decides the type of the room, but also some of the content, uh, and then it's trying to create a, it starts out with uh, converting that into a low resolution tile map, converts it to a high resolution tile map, and, and start populating that. And that's even, you know, this is just five steps of that process, but in, in, in reality for Explore 2, there's about 40 different steps within that process, all and each and every step in itself uh, had a very targeted and particular uh, thing it added. So some some step would just uh, add monsters to it, or just uh, assess the the, uh, the difficulty level, or it would just um, create an interesting curve and in the pacing. Uh, all these things they were all very uh, dedicated and detailed uh, steps. Um, and I think there's a lot of advantages to working in that way. Um, one of them is that you if, you, if you don't lock down everything from the start, there's a lot of freedom and a lot of um, uh, possibilities that you can resolve at a later stage. So, uh, for example, at, 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 at a particular stage in the, in the, in the design process, you know, when the, uh, the level is just rooms with locks and keys, the, the level generator hasn't specified what sort of keys and what sort of locks uh, should be used. Um, and it can, at a later stage, uh, looking at the themes that might be associated with a level, start specifying these uh, in more interesting ways. So, for example, if, um, if, there would be a, if there's a fire theme active in this level, uh, a lock might be a field of lava, and the key might be a, a potion that makes you immune to the damage, damage the lava does, so you can walk across it. 
um, and all these sort of things. And, uh, uh, but the same level layout could be resolved in a different way if, if the themes were different. If, there's, if, if, if the theme would be traps, for example, then the lock might be a very narrow corridor, corridor with a lot of traps and a potion that allows you to fly over it or something. There's a lot of ways and a lot of way, uh, different ways that uh, the generator can combine all these things. But it's important that the, ge that the generator has uh, the knowledge to do these things. So, for example, if you look at lock and keys, um, then you need the generator to be aware of the different attributes uh, the lock and keys have. You know, the, the, the lava uh, potion might be consumable, so you might be able to use it only once. And this sets an important constraint on the, on the level side of the, the cases where you could use it. Um, and this is this is all uh, has to be taken into consideration. Um, but there is um, a few things that if you do this, um, that gives so much better um, sense for gameplay. You know, uh, you have to be aware of all these things. Uh, uh, an interesting example is uh, if you look at the difficulty curves and progression. You know, it's it's if you're using automated automated tools, it's very easy to try to create a very smooth difficulty curve. Uh, but I found out that that doesn't really need, necessarily lead to interesting games. Um, when explored, actually, we we started to try to make the uh, the, the, the difficulty curve quite bumpy, uh, quite bumpy, and, and uh, so there's moments where there's nothing happening, and then there's all of, all of a sudden there's moments where there's a lot of uh, room filled with uh, with monsters jumping out of you as soon as the door closes, um, and this this creates much better gameplay. Um, uh, another good example would be you know if you uh, if you have, uh, as we have, 20 levels in the dungeon uh, and you want to control the number of health potions and life potions that you, you're going to throw into the dungeon, what you don't want to do, uh, or at least uh, if you spread out all those potions, you say, well, there's going to be two health potions on every level, and you get a completely different experience than when there is uh, uh, a few levels without any health potions and then a level that has six. Um, this creates a much better and it's more interesting experience. Um, and also, as I already mentioned, um, you could have levels that are very big because what well, content is cheap if you if you generated them if you generated them, but that's not necessarily, not necessarily better. Uh, uh, as we went along and made unexplored, actually tended, ended up making the levels smaller and smaller and and apply stronger themes to the levels to actually uh, give every level a unique and different experience. So this level, uh, this, uh, which is actually uh, the, one of the bottom levels where you can find a dragon that you need to defeat to grab the amulet, it's a fairly simple level. It's just one big field of lava with a couple of rooms, but that's all you need to actually make this encounter work. There's a lot of levels before that already, so you don't need the extra content. It's, um, uh, and, and, and there's just a few things going on. Uh, and it's interesting just to swap out a couple of themes. Uh, for example, this level there is, uh, is a combination of poison gas with um, a particular dark, uh, a dark and light uh, settings, and it creates um, a much stronger visual experience. It, it, it doesn't look as noisy as, as you, you get, and it's actually very easy to, to generate all these things. Uh, basically, what I did is there is a, there's a bunch of themes, about 20 or 30 in total, uh, and I just make sure that every level has a couple of those themes active at the same time, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four, uh, and not, not much more. And then you already get a lot of combinations. And you, know, uh, you can easily do the math. There's so many combinations there already. Uh, and then the game starts surprising you. Um, this is, for example, an interesting combination of a, of a level that was generated on with a couple of themes axes, such as there can only be rooms, but there's also chasms, and there's teleporters. And it, and, and it came up with this level with all these small platforms that you have to walk in this narrow bridge is collapsing and teleports you, that allows you to, uh, to teleport from uh, to platform to platform, but you're never quite sure if there's going to be a bunch of uh, monsters on, on the same platform. Uh, and the first time I saw this, I, I was not really aware that the, the content generator could do this, but um, it did, and it really surprised me. And then I started locking down, okay, this is an interesting combination, and the only thing that I did um, is make sure that this combination has uh, uh, does does happen now now and then. So I, I could sometimes use these couple of themes to make sure that there's a special theme for 
for a, for a special floor for special for or a specific enemy or something, um, and that re works really really well. Um, and this is also something uh, that's very counter was very counterintuitive to me um, when I started exploring and and and. Um, dabbling with content generation a long, long time ago. The, th the reason for me was that I wanted to be surprised. I wanted to create an algorithm that could do something um, that, and surprise me, do something new. Um, so I started, always started out with trying to set up the generator in such a way that it, uh, uh, that it, that it sort of creates new things. But you don't really get good results or you get very noisy things. And it was later during the... Um, during the process that I started realizing that you don't want uh, the generator to be tailored to new things. You want actually the generator to be tailored to give shape, uh, a familiar shape, but uh, use a, a very random starting position. So um, you start off with a um, maybe a very noisy map, and then you try to put a shape into that, try to look, look for shapes, um, try to uh, Actually, organize it, not not randomize it. You want to organize a random uh, random thing, and that creates so much better results. So, if, to take for example, go back to this uh, this diagram that we saw earlier. Uh, um, given different themes or different solutions or different possibilities, there's a lot of different ways that we can organize this this structure. But to generate a lot of different structures like this is very easy, and that's not really where the, the magic of the content generator happens. It happens when it you know, it's, it's trying to make sense of the, the chaos that you that you feed it um, and um, so one of the things that we discovered also uh, not, not the only one to discover this um, but that that we uh, that the content generator really 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 improved the content generation was to start really looking at design lore and implement that in a very interesting way. And the cyclic dungeon generation, I don't know if you heard of it, uh, was a very big step in that. The idea is that if you look at um, content generators, what they often do is that you start out with a, a simple structure. So somebody starting in the level and you have a goal and then you sort of create add branching paths to uh, to that structure uh, and use locking keys to sort of basically lock the way to the goal so that you have to explore uh, the entire dungeon. And there's a whole uh, whole lot of generators that work like it, whether or not it's, it's templates or not. Um, but at one point I realized that if you um, uh, use not branches but cycles as the basic as the very basic uh, uh, building stone of your dungeons, you get a completely different a type of level. You get levels where uh, you uh, you might find a key and then there's immediately a shortcut back uh, uh, bringing you back to the main dungeon where you can find uh, the lock that you, where you were previously uh, uh, barred out. So there is uh, a much better flow to this and it's, this feels much more natural. Um, uh, this is this is something that uh, we discovered at a workshop in Banff, and actually uh, Kay Compton, the, the next speaker, is, was also part of the same uh, work group. And we were exploring how to generate parks, and and, and we started looking at different uh, theories of, of how parks are uh, structured, and and, and other, uh, also other types of experiences structured. And we came across this uh, notion of hypertext, where uh, loops are very important. And we decided. If, if you if you do a walk in a park or an, an environment, you don't want to go from one point to uh, another point and then go back. No, you, prefer, you most people prefer to do a, a roundabout route. You go one way over and another way back. Um, and this is a very interesting way of structuring your uh, your environments. Um, and when I came back from this workshop and started, I was already working on explored, and I thought this is actually a very good idea. And I had a picnic with my uh, my daughters, and we actually had a, a picnic at a, at a simple field of grass where there was a table. And I noticed, my you know, as soon as there's something you can run around, uh, little kin children will start running around things. You know, they they always move around in, in circles. Uh, if you have a house where you can actually make a circle, that's what ki uh, kids will do. It's a, it's a very intuitive way of experiencing space. Um, 
And so I started looking at, at some hand, handcrafted uh, maps. And if you look at the best hand designed uh, maps for Dungeons and Dragons and, and that sort of thing, there's all these interesting uh, cycles in there. There's never, it's never a branching tree, it's always cycles. Um, and I started thinking about the cycles. Yeah, there's a lot of ways you can sort of uh, create a lot of simple patterns um, and then mash them together and you get almost instantly uh, uh, good results. Uh, the, I ended up for an explore uh, and ended up and then finding about 12 of these patterns. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I implemented them all because I didn't need it. It's just five or six patterns and then recomb comb uh, making combinations of two or three of them in an every level is already all you need. Um, so, uh, but you know, the, this, this thinking about all these things, it's, it's all about how to actually gra uh, grab the, 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 the lore of the, what designers do and, and try to put that into, into, the, into the pipeline. Um, and you know, if, if you think about it from a design perspective, uh, it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense, you know, cycles work, uh, because cycles sort of foreground uh, growth. You know, if, if you look at a lot of Zelda games, they use a lot of cycles in, in the dungeon structures just because you, know, you, you want the, the player to venture into a dungeon, hit, hit a, a door that they can't open, uh, venture further, find something that will help them, and then make their way back, and then discover, okay, now I can actually cross this barrier, and now, uh, and, and, and as a result, the player experiencing is, is experiencing the growth of the character. Whereas if, you, if your dungeon would be completely linear and you would never revisit the same areas, you, you would never experience that same growth. You never experience that you're getting better at the game. And it's a, it's a fundamental thing in game design. Um, however, uh, as sophisticated as, as you can make the dungeon generator, it will never ever be um, uh, foolproof. So we also uh, uh, we were working with a, a live audience at one point, and you know, no matter how cleverly you design these 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 dungeons, people would do weird things and and they would run into bugs. Uh, sometimes, you know, as, as in this case, the, the content generator did something weird and placed the window at a place where it shouldn't have placed the window, uh, and that's okay. No, but no, nobody really bothers, but it does happen. Sometimes, you know, it actually blocks your way, um, and uh, you, you need to st start thinking of a, of a design. Uh, and and, ex and explored, um, the problem also is, is, is uh, so, sort of double, because you have to be able to go inside the dungeon and also back up. So every level had to be, uh, you have to be able to navigate every level in two directions. Also, we had this thing, uh, uh, teleportation scroll that would teleport you to a random position on the level. And it should always, you should always, if you do something like that, uh, if, 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 if you want things, keep, uh, want to keep things simple, you don't want to do that. Don't run teleportation. But if you have it, then you have to better make sure that every uh, room you can escape from. Otherwise, people will feel, uh, will feel, uh, will feel very unfair. But even then, you know, uh, uh, an explorer makes use makes use of these trap rooms. And um, for example, a trap room would be you would walk into a room, the door would close behind you, a, a threat would get uh, activated. That might be monsters or a, 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 a dangerous gas, but it would always be some f sort of escape. That could be a teleportation pad that would take you into safety, a secret door that would leave, leave you out, or a scroll of teleportation that would uh, put you somewhere else in the dungeon. Uh, however, what people would do is they would use the scroll of teleportation, get out, and then realize that they left some treasure in the same room, so they would go back in, and then the teleportation escapes already used, because in this case, the escape was consumable. Uh, the players are very, very creative in the, in the ways that they can paint themselves into all these little corners. And it's always the game that you have to name, it's never the, never the player. So at one point, uh, we needed to have a solution. Um, and the, the solutions to these problems, uh, you, if you can't solve them technically, you have to solve them in the design space. And the design space that we used is, um, uh, at this point is that we uh, start using uh, this, this button here, uh, um, being, this being a fantasy game uh, with gods and everything, and you could pray for help. And what would happen if, if you do something like that, um, 
uh, if you if you if you pray for help, hang on, I want to clear my drawings here. If you if you do pray for help, hang on, this is not clear my drawings. And now I want to continue. Yeah, no. Oh. If you uh, if you do pray for help, uh, the the game would actually sort of run an analysis. Uh, in the background, seeing if you were very close to certain obstacles you couldn't cross. But because we also also have all the other uh, information, we have a very high level description of the dungeon in, in a graph, we could do sort of uh, uh, checks whether or not parts of the graph, especially parts with entrances and exits, uh, were still reachable by the player. And if they were not, then they were probably justified in, in, in trying to get some help. Uh, to prevent players from abusing a system like this, um, uh, we set up a, a sort of a karma system. Now, if you start using this system often, uh, then you start to have to pay more, uh, a bigger price. This could be monsters that uh, the game could spawn on you. Um, and especially if you would abuse the system. So uh, if, the, if you stand in front of a door, uh, the game would run an analysis. Uh, and even if it decides, well, there's a key behind you, and you could simply use the door, that to open the door, so there's no real problem. It would still open the door, but it will uh, it would make you pay more. Basically, it's that, that's what it did. So that's actually very effective in, in uh, uh, stopping players from abusing the system. Uh, but there's other solutions too. You know, uh, you could have if, if if all the walls in the game were destructible somehow, that solves a lot of problems already, uh, because then nothing is actually a barrier anymore. But because we had these hard barriers, we had to come up with something. Um, as I told you, uh, I'm also working on the, the sequel by now. And uh, the sequel, which is uh, very unimaginatively called Unexplored 2, um, uh, we are uh, reusing all the design lessons and we actually felt very good because all the things that we learned from Unexplored 2, we could implement them from the start from in Unexplored well, uh, uh, all the things that we learned from the, the first game we could uh, implement from the start in the second game. Uh, but there's a lot of things that we uh, we kept. Uh, we're just iterating and building on top of the, the previous layer. Um, so, uh, an Explore 2 is different though. It's no longer a dungeon crawler. It's it's an overworld journey. Um, but And, and the, one of the most important lessons that I started with is the one that you know, make the levels small. Uh, we could try to generate a continuous, enormous overworld, but that's not really what what's interesting. You know, that would take too many, too much time to travel from one side to another. We want to focus on the interesting scenes. So the, the, the levels and the nodes that we're generating, they should have the same interesting scenes, and we want to have a lot of shape to them. You know, there's just a, a single line, a single road with uh, monumental hands leading up to something. That's a very powerful, uh, powerful environment, and it's interesting to generate. And it le needs a lot of high-level thinking about how the generator should work. Uh, obviously, we're also generating the entire world map, um, and that's uh, you can tell by the the, the line that's uh, with the notes there. Uh, there's a lot number of notes on every map, and those those represent uh, locations that the, the the player can visit. Um, so there's a whole network of, of about 300 nodes uh, laid over the, uh, the entire map, um, and it's you know it's it's that's a, that's a much more interesting um, experience for us to try to generate. The map itself should be interesting, obviously, with barriers. And uh, if you look at the different maps that, that uh, we generate, there is uh, a few things that, that we set uh, set up uh, fixed in stone, such as there's always going to be an ocean on the left and. And there's always going to be some mountains on the, on the, on the, on the right, uh, just to make things interesting. Uh, and this map is not really generated in, in, a, in a geological uh, valid way. No, it's, it's really pure all about the gameplay. We're looking at barriers and, and environments and uh, uh, place, uh, places, uh, environments to hide things. Um, and the environments themselves, if you zoom in on every note, they need to be very, very interesting. Uh, and Obviously, you can tell by now that we've uh, uh, we've got a bigger team, a better artist working on the game. Um, uh, so the game is already starting to look better, but it's it's it might, and it's and it's all generated. It's you know, it's uh, but it's not as random as you see, uh, as it, as it might seem. Uh, for example, this scene 
which is a screenshot that we've used a lot to in, in the marketing right now. It's, it's a generated world, but it's, an, it's a very particular template. Uh, the, this, this, this structure itself, the, the, the temple, the, the glowing door that opens, uh, obviously is, is, is a single asset, but it's a place, a placement in environment. It's, it's not as a, it's a particular cliff with um, uh, mountains going down, but also going back up to uh, make uh, to make you experience the height difference a, a little bit better. It's, it's really thought of how everything is placed and, and, and put into in, in that lab. Um, so I'm getting to the uh, the tools part of the of the talk. Um, as was mentioned, we use a lot of uh, content generation uh, using a lot of. Uh, uh, Generative grammars to generate all the all the things that we do, uh, and I'm going to dive in the, the tools. So I'm going to share my sc the screen and uh, share the tools in 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 a, in a, in a second. Uh, but I first want to uh, talk a little bit about some of the philosophy of the tools. Um, the tool that we uh, that, that we use is called Uniscope, which I've been developing for years and years, uh, and it's really tailor made to uh, fulfill all my wishes. Um, and it can do a lot of things. So uh, here you can see an overview screen of, of all the, the steps in, within content, in, in the content generation of a single lab in Linux Core 2. And it's probably already 30, 30 different uh, circles on there. And every circle represents a, a different generative uh, step in the process. Um, yeah, but, but we're working on these tools and, and uh, working on the content generator for Linux Core 2 uh, really puts, uh, puts me in mind of a talk by Emily Short, I saw two or three years ago at, at the Pro, uh, Procedure Content Generation Jam, uh, where she was talking about uh, the, 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 the interactive travel guide that she made. Uh, uh, and an interesting thing, what she did is she had a, a number of iterations of uh, the content generator. Uh, so she generated a completely guide of a, of a fantasy world uh, and then made changes and, and that uh, that iterative uh, process went on for a little while, and then she published the end result. So she did never published the, the generator or the process uh, leading up to it, uh, but it was a very iterative process. And I do also feel uh, very similar in my uh, experience with Ludoscope, you know, where it's uh, where there's a lot of back and forth. Uh, between uh, between um, uh, us and the and, and the content generator uh, uh, and, and under the hood, so I probably need to stop sharing this. Uh, it says my in internet connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? There's something in the chat. Um, can I, yeah, okay, let's. I, I'm, I'm going to assume that my internet's still working here. Um, I'm going to share on, uh, the, the the content generator. Okay, uh, it seems that. Okay, but you can hear me now again, right? Um, Yes, okay, cool. Um, okay, well, I was just talking a little bit more about Lewis Cope and the philosophy, but um, uh, that's all good because now we're going to talk, uh, I'm going to actually show you the, 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 the content generator. Um, so, this is uh, uh, the process uh, in Unexplored of generating uh, a complete world map. Um, and uh, the final map in, in the such as a four and eye gram add a base structure, um, and those the structures. They're all uh, based on, um, uh, I closed, the, oh, hang on. I closed the, the questions window. So if you want to ask questions, feel free to do so. Um, uh, so it makes, see from the land, uh, adding a starting position and a, um, 
uh, and a goal location for you where you need to need to be in, uh, to win the game. Um, and this works in, 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 in two ways importantly. So first of all, there is uh, a number of uh, grammar rules. Uh, it's, uh, I'm struggling, I'm fighting a little bit with a lot of windows over here. So it get overlaid on my screen. No. Well, so there's basically it's looking for, what is it looking for? Uh, an ocean node next to an undefined node uh, that's actually on the top border of the diagram. And then it can replace uh, replace it with uh, the, uh, with two ocean nodes. So it can grow water at the top, water at the bottom. It's a lot of different rules uh, that it can use. Um, but if you just would execute the grammar, it would get uh, some, uh, yeah, it's graph grammars based on them. Uh, um, on a Voronoi, because a Voronoi gram is basically a graph in the end. Um, so, but if you just execute this, it will get not the best results. So we can reset the diagram and it will just take the input uh, uh, as it input. It will take the output of the previous uh, node in the, in the whole process. And if I just start uh, executing rules, it would just do a random thing. It will not get the result that we wanted. So it has different starting positions, different ending positions. Uh, instead, what I do is uh, define recipes. Uh, I hope this is big enough for you to see. Saying uh, iterate this rule uh, and do it once, and do uh, another rule and do it uh, 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 random times. So and uh, you can see that I've been playing tabletop role-playing games, so I use a dice notation to express randomness. Okay, this is, seems to be a problem. Uh, okay, so you can still hear me right, can't you? Okay, I'll make sure that I'll not... Uh, okay. I'll make sure that I won't drag around too many screens then, maybe that, that will help. Um, what I can also do is make this smaller. Uh, maybe that saves some processing power and bandwidth. Uh, probably want to make this smaller too. I don't know how that looks on your screen, but I uh, hope this comes, comes across nicely. Um, Okay, cool. So, if you do these things, oh, does it show, probably have to overlap this, you can still see this. Okay. Um, so, I was talking about these uh, registers, uh, sorry, recipes, and they basically sort of uh, guide the process saying, well, I want to, uh, uh, use this, this rule first to make sure that there is water at one edge and there's water at the top and the bottom. And then I can place one star uh, on, the, on the side, grow the water a little bit more, place the, um, uh, the end, end thing and, and, and go on. And, uh, and then make sure that there is, uh, there's also some annotation. So it's see marking every cell with the distance to the starting to the, to the goal. Uh, one nice thing of, uh, of this tool is that it can also do checks, so I can make a quick um, uh, uh, it can always do a quick uh, heuristic see if there's if there's actually start and an and, and end goal and if they're not too close um, and then and, and then go on. The rules are not always applied linearly. I'm not quite sure what linear in this context uh, if you you would say linear is. Uh, what happens is there's three different ways a rule can be executed. Um, oh, this is the wrong one. Let me show you here. Uh, a room can be uh, 
executed linearly, where uh, uh, there's one rule applied at Simon and the next and the next and the next. I can apply it as an as a, as a L system, a Lindemeyer system, saying that F, I'm going to uh, select one rule for every node in the graph, um, and then uh, or I'm actually going to step through all the nodes in the graph, apply one rule to each, but apply it immediately. And the cellular automata is is I'm going to select one rule uh, that can only modify uh, the, the one node, and then apply them uh, uh, at once, all the, uh, simultaneously. So I hope that answers your question. Um, so you can see this, for example, if I'm going to look at the, the uh, western edge is, is uh, water, if, if it's exceeded normally, uh, sorry, can you this one, then it will do uh, one at a time. But if I say I'm going to do this as an L system, and do, it does all of them at this in, in one step. So that's, uh, that's basically the difference. Um, and it, uh, at one point, it's going to say we're well, going to add some mountains to make the make it more difficult to uh, uh, reach the goal. Um, it, it's going to add some sites. That's basically basically those are very important sites where uh, objects of the main quest are going to be hidden, and some of them are already in a in a particular landscape. So this site is in a, in, a, in a forest. Where others, this one's actually on a, on a mountain top, where others are still unspecified. Um, and it, uh, it's adding uh, rivers by uh, the rest of the land, actually uh, chopped up in different uh, regions. And then rivers start to grow on the, on the boundaries between regions. And, and, and sometimes they grow a little bit into a region, it depends on what type of region it is. They obviously can't really grow into, uh, into uh, mountains, but they can grow into forests and swamps. Uh, it's going to set terrain types and annotate some of the, these things also as, as, as a particular, uh, belonging to a particular faction, either the Imperials or the, the Weird faction, which is something in, inside the game. And, and then it's actually sort of making the area graph a little bit simpler. Uh, so that I can treat all the areas as, as, a, as a single unit and determine what, what are the particular qualities of that area based on its size, based on its type of terrain, based on, uh, on its uh, sort of difficulty, uh, because the further you get away from the start, the more difficult they should become. So there's dangers and opportunities in every area, and, and the further you get away from the starting point, the more dangers there are. Um, and basically, uh, there is a final map represent representation Get sent to the game, and also the the region graph uh, is 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 a data structure that that gets sent uh, gets sent to the game. But let me open up the. Uh, no, you don't need to save this. Uh, the the other part of the generator, because every time because it is generating the the whole landscape um, of the whole entire world map. Uh, every time you travel to a node, uh, you open, you get a basically it's generating a tile map uh, using tile grammars and graph grammars. Uh, it's like it made a, a small dungeon map where you start here and then you can start exploring the dungeon, and it's still using these uh, the, uh, the cycle rules, but applied in a slightly different way. Um, and the way this starts is actually uh, starts from a low resolution tile map where I uh, add a basic structure, in this case, uh, two cycles with uh, uh, two valves, the green things are valves, so in one, you can only travel in this direction, you can only travel back, uh, and these are gates, and, and the difference between a gate and a valve is once this is open, you can always go back and forth. Um, so, uh, so there's two, two basic cycles, and then maybe it adds some variation, I'm not quite sure if it did, no, you know, well, the, laid out try to make better use of the space but sometimes it can make a small side room or something or uh, add, add a window between two things that are next to each other uh, and this get actually gets actually sort of translated into a graph where uh, you can see there's a trap and a lock here um, so to get past this trap uh, you might be locked in but then there's always another way out but if you haven't explored here there might be monsters you, what, uh, you, you might never know um, and this gets sort of 
uh, analyzed and decorated. So it's, it's starting to say, well, there's a key for the lock here and it has to be here because it has, needs to be behind the trap because otherwise it would be very nasty if you need to find the key here and you get, can get trapped inside. Uh, but it's also placing the goal here and a bonus location there. It's, it's assigning these purple, or the magenta uh, things that, so, uh, to, uh, rules for the rooms, such as this room needs to be hazardous or not, or uh, this has, has to be marked as the entrance. And it's starting populating all these things uh, with uh, with features and, and, and things. So here it also resolve the the valves in a particular way. Let's see what it what it is. So it's a sink gate. So it probably is a, a trigger here that opens simply opens this thing if you're in this room and closes again if you're in in the room there. Um, in the meantime, um, this graph gets processed. The tile map gets also processed further. Uh, and at one point gets uh, sampled up. So it's actually, I can show you this process. Um, and there's a, uh, it's, again, it's a lot of recipes in here. Um, it's, it's basically stepping through, the, just doing doing these things. And then it's basically blows up every tile and says, well, now it's 25 tiles, like by five. And I'm going to use uh, some uh, uh, noise generators and actually, Rules that are very similar to the the four or five uh, uh, cave uh, generator uh, four or five uh, cellular automata for cave generation uh, to uh, make these things nicer and, and sort of hide the, the the strict tiles. So you can see here, I'm just adding some randomness and then along the edges, and then I'm uh, using the four or five algorithm. Um, and it's, I'm going to do that again for the the edges there and then trying to make them as small as possible in this case and then you have uh, something there um, at the later stage uh, um, at this point it decides where barriers need to be and, and the features are placed based on, on, on what, what was specified uh, by the graph um, and then it's actually starting to do this uh, in, in, in a couple of layers uh, because it's, it's, it's one, one uh, set of tiles, it's actually the, the type of ground, so it's cave walls and dirt, and this looks like bedrock. And it also has, in, has information about the elevation, so this is low, three is low, six is the regular elevation. And it also has some information about the, um, uh, the shapes it should sort of more or less have. There's a, if you're interested in that, there's an article I wrote on, on Gamma Sutra uh, showing how I use this tile information actually get a much better flowing and uh, more natural looking environment out of it but it's a, it's a little bit besides the point here uh, i don't think there's any water no there's no water in this level so there's also no bridges this is also not very interesting um, here you can see the decoration so it's the walls and some of the gameplay features there's some spikes for in the chasm uh, and basically all these things get tiled uh, stacked on top of, top of each other and you have a, a big uh, tile map, um, but this this basically it's all um, it's all uh, graph rules of a uh, tile based grammars. So in this case, grammars look like uh, look like this. So if I have a corner of, of constructs which are basically walls, then I can place sometimes you can place these things in there. There's a, sometimes these are pretty big snippets it's using. Um, trying to find them as, as best as they can in, 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 in the map and populate them like that. So um, that's basically how it works. Looking at the time, we're also almost done for time, but there's, there's, there's opportunities for questions if you have any. Uh, for, so the, 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 yeah, you, you probably, I assume you can all, all read the question. Um, um, Mark, this is answered, answered. Um, so the pray for help, it actually came later. So uh, I didn't realize uh, the, the problem that we had uh, until we were already in, open, uh, in early access. Um, so we already had players and people would get stuck and they would complain about it, and rightly so. Uh, and I had to come up with a solution. And, and the solution uh, make the graph of make the dungeon generator better 
uh, uh, proved to be impossible because sometimes the, the, the problem was actually in the design space of the game and uh, not even the generator was to blame. So there should always have been a uh, uh, solution. So that, uh, so I later I, I used the, uh, that, that, uh, the, 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 I came up with the, the pray for help function. But the beautiful thing about the, the graph premise is that you know, more, uh, I didn't need it as much uh, because the graph graphs sort of guarantee that there is a solution to the to, to the entire space. I don't have to analyze it as much. Uh, yeah, for the the switch, um, uh, that's that's a problem that we ha had had uh, because the gen the generator that we use is very memory intensive. Uh, uh, you, you saw this, uh, there's, there's a lot of nodes and a lot of uh, things that we need, we need to generate. Um, so it, it's using a lot of memory and using memory on the switch is very expensive. Uh, okay, I need to, uh, sure, I'll, I will repeat the answers. Um, so um, somebody ask, uh, is asking me that on the switch, uh, we generate the dungeon uh, while we're playing and uh, this uh, sometimes uh, causes the, the game to stop a little bit. And the message that you get there is that the dungeon is being generated, but that's actually not true. It's what happens is that uh, the, the garbage collection is running. Um, so otherwise the switch would run out of memory because on the switch, memory is uh, somewhat sparse. So I hope that answers your question. Maybe I should answer, click answer first. So I'm going to do this. How do you approach the aesthetics of gameplay experience in terms of rules? Uh, do you have any aspects of like intensity, et cetera, modeled in the generation? Yes, exactly. That's, that's um, uh, what I do. Um, although intensity is, in, is, is somewhat of a vague um, uh, concept in, in, in this regard, uh, you, you have uh, building blocks that leads up to uh, an interesting intensity curve. So the generator is very aware of this is an intense room and this is not an intense room. So it can actually make that contrast. Uh, and then there is different uh, themes that sort of uh, make sure that uh, in this case, um, intensity differences get amplified, whereas, whereas you might uh, come up with another theme that might be active, where it's actually sort of doing the, uh, doing the opposite. And, and, and smoothing out the entire experience. Uh, but basically, uh, I, t I tend to do the, the former uh, most. Uh, so it's actually looking, obviously, uh, in most cases, it's actually looking at opportunities to, to group dangers together because that always get, gets more experience, better experience than, than spread out. So I hope that answers the question. Um, you have this layering of recipes. Given this, do you have uh, global guarantees that each level has some properties, solvable, fun, et cetera. Um, that's what they are there for. Okay. Um, it's, uh, the layering of recipes is, is, is more or less uh, used for, for that exactly. Um, so without the recipes, it would be very, very hard to control all these, these things. Um, uh, but it's a little bit lower level than that, I guess. So I use the recipes a lot to make sure that there's only one entrance and one exit, for example. Um, and there might be two cycles. And then the recipes themselves, they're sort of, uh, uh, they sort of guaranteed or sort of, sort of hand scripted and designed to a certain extent, uh, because sometimes there's randomness in there. And actually uh, the generator can also generate recipes. I uh, use them in this, within the same process, so it can go quite meta on that. So I hope that answers that question. Um, so uh, the question is, you have quite a complex interface. Do you think there's a more intuitive way to uh, present this kind of generation to designers? Um, that's also uh, a good, very good question. Um, the problem is that uh, generative grammars themselves are somewhat uh, complex. And you need to grasp that concept uh, as a designer. And some designers actually can do can work with that pretty well, but it's not all of them. Sometimes some, some of them like to work more intuitively. Um, so I'd say 
it's definitely not up for every designer and the interface that we have you know i'm not a, a user interface designer or actually did not spend that much time on it because it's i've made this for me and i can work with it and the, the, the people i work with can work with it um so that's uh, that's good enough for us but there is actually we're, we're looking into ways of of opening that just up for for a wider audience at one one point but we're not quite there yet so i hope that answers that question um uh do i have an agent that plays a generated levels for you uh, to look for edge cases um well that's that's more or less what happens when the play for help uh, is uh, function is called it doesn't do so within the um, uh in the generator itself i've often thought of a function like that and and but i never really really got to implementing that you can actually make grammars do something very similar but it's probably not very efficient you know you can have a grammar that moves a cursor through uh, a dungeon like this um, and, and use it to test things. Um, but I never never did because ultimately I never really needed it. Uh, uh, and, the, and the reason for that is that, uh, that it turned out that the levels were good enough uh, for, what, for our purposes uh, and I didn't want to spend the time building it. But it's actually a very interesting uh, research angle to, to, to explore. So next question, just looking at the time there. Um, I guess this will be the last question as, as we've run out of time. Um, do you get the impression that the recipes limit the possibility space too much? Um, I found that applying rules completely randomly give you much more varied results with recipe uh, risk, feeling kind of samey. Um, that's true, uh, and this goes back to one of the points I tried to make earlier. Um, in my experience, what works best if, is if that you start with a very random starting position and then use recipes to try to uh, make that to turn it into a shape that's actually understandable for, for humans uh, to play through. Um, uh, so there is so certain modules within the system that can actually go wild and can do weird things. And then there's other modules to try to uh, converge whatever randomness, uh, the random input they have into shapes that make sense. So uh, it's uh, so there's, there's opportunities to diverge and there's opportunities to converge. Uh, but the diver uh, uh, diversion is actually fairly easy. You know? um, one of the, the, the earliest steps I do within the, the world map is actually using a, a Fortnite diagram. and things you could do that would actually get very interesting results is, is actually have a look at the size of each cell and use the size of each cell to, uh, um, to, to determine its type of terrain and then you um, so for example smaller cells would be mountains and bigger cells would be plains or something or water uh, and then generate a land from that and that starts out probably fairly noisy but then you kind of start swapping things around and try to put it into shapes um, so it's starting to converge on 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 something but that, that conversion step is really really important and i think in my experience at least it's the most important uh, uh, most important step because uh, that's where uh, that's where that's when actually levels start to feel good and not random because it's the, otherwise you, you often end up with lots of noise so i guess we're out of time now. Uh, thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can find online and you can always uh, contact me. I'm, uh, I'm always glad to help other, other people with content generation. So you're welcome.